Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Smattering, where we like to ask the important questions about investing. I'm Jason Hall, joined by the voice of the people, Jeff Santoro. How are you, Jeff? I'm great. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. I um, Apparently, I have a new a new nickname. I'm the destroyer of segues, but I couldn't yes. figure out a segue to destroy in that in that transition right there. Well, this is already awkward, so you're off to a great start. Fantastic. All right, everybody. I think I think you're going to like what we're doing today. This is going to be very different. We've had a few guests on that we've interviewed, uh, a few notable people, a few experts in different areas. I actually got interviewed by somebody who thinks I'm an expert of some sort. Um, and actually, he's the expert, and I just tricked him. Um, some of you may know Nick Rossellillo. Jeff, you know Nick. I do know Nick, yeah. And he is absolutely an expert, and you are absolutely not. Yes, that is 100% correct. So Nick is an expert in uh, the semiconductor industry. He is a wonderful investor, one of the smartest people of the room in the room, whatever room he's in. He has a great YouTube channel looking at chip stocks and semiconductors. And he and I got engaged in a conversation on Twitter about Texas Instruments and Taiwan Semiconductor and whether or not Texas Instruments was actually a better company than Taiwan Semiconductor. Nick reached out to me and said, hey, let's have a conversation about this. And we did. And it's been a few weeks ago um, since Nick ran that on his channel. And we decided it turned out really good. Um, I'm going to take some credit for that. But frankly, most of the credit is going to go to to Nick. But Jeff and I talked about it. And we talked with Nick and we decided this would be a great opportunity to share some great content from other people out there that we know that we think is going to help all of you uh, on your investing investing journeys. Yeah, and the, the timing of this is great. So we're we're recording this on uh, after the market close on February 14th. And uh, we'll talk a little bit in the B block about the news that dropped today from uh, Berkshire Hathaway's 13F uh, disclosure. But um, this isn't going to air until next week. But we just found out today that uh, Buffett or someone in Berkshire Hathaway actually sold uh, most of their um, Taiwan Semiconductor position. So we'll chat a little bit about that after the interview. So stick around for that. And then we have another topic we're going to discuss as well. Okay, Jeff, let's hand it over to me and Nick now. We are here today to talk about two very beloved semiconductor stocks, Texas Instruments and Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. And... I have a very special guest with me, Jason Hall from The Smattering Podcast and YouTube channel. Jason, thanks for joining me. How's it going? Nick, I'm, exci I'm excited about having this conversation. I, I am too. Uh, and in doing the prep for this, um, I learned a few things. So it's already a win for me. And I, I, think, I think viewers are going to like this. Basis for this conversation, Jason... Uh, this is a rated G channel, so I'm going to read the edited version of your tweet. It was actually a PG tweet, and I'm just going to make it G. Uh, <laughs> you said your immediate reaction to seeing this comment that Texas Instruments is a stronger business than Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. Your immediate reaction was, oh, yeah, I think I actually believe it, too. So some might call that bold talk. Texas Instruments a stronger business than Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, the largest, most advanced semiconductor manufacturing company on the planet. Why do you think Texas Instruments is a stronger business? So, you know, it's, it's, uh, and it's, it's funny because like, you know, I made this tweet in response to, to the tweet that was out there. And I've been thinking a lot more about it since then um, to really challenge my own bias. Do I really believe this? What is what is the, the reasons I believe it? And kind of what I've come down to, Nick, is I think, first of all, the analog semiconductor part of the of the semi value chain, I think, is grossly misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And I think about Texas Instruments and I think about Taiwan Semi, who are both by far first in class companies. And I see Taiwan Semiconductor spending a tremendous amount of CapEx. Now, they're taking advantage of the tailwinds to grow, but they're largely doing it because they have to. If they're going to remain the most advanced semiconductor manufacturing company in the world, they have to spend the money that they've committed to spend. Texas Instruments 
similarly is spending money to grow, but it, the, the money that it's spending is also going to be growing its economic moats. Just one example um, is it's spending – at the same time, it's expanding its capacity. It's increasing its wafer size, which is going to give it even increase – like double – it's going to increase its cost advantages by double digits. So to kind of sum all of that up, I see Texas uh, – Taiwan Semiconductor is just kind of keeping its edge, and Texas Instruments is sharpening its blade. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to share uh, a chart here to illustrate that, Jason. Uh, so Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing primarily manufactures digital chips. So those are the chips that process the zeros and ones that make up that make up a long chain uh, of of data, and it means nothing to you and I. Uh, Texas Instruments, on the other hand, three quarters of its revenue in the last quarter is analog chips. So analog chips have the ability to interact with a real world signal. It might be speech, it might be video or an image, it might be a radio wave. It could be any number of things, but it's a real world, actual tangible signal that humans can also detect with our ears or our eyes or whatever. And that analog chip converts it into the digital signal that the chips Taiwan Semi manufactures. So like the smartphone chips, PC, PC chips, um, customers ranging from Apple to AMD to NVIDIA and Qualcomm, you name it. So I, I provide provide that chart here to build on your, your point here about capital spending. What is it exactly uh, about Texas Instruments focus on analog chips that gives it kind of a, a bit more of an edge? Um, or specifically, what what is the edge that they've created around those analog chips that that Taiwan Semi doesn't have at this point? So, I think they they both have it to some degree. I want I think that's really important. Um, but but I think the biggest key. So you think about a Taiwan Semiconductor, right? They 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 spend billions in capex. They roll in the latest ASML and other companies machines to produce those leading edge, the most advanced semiconductors in the world at that time for about two years, <laughs> right? And then wash, rinse, repeat. You have to continually stay ahead of that of that curve on the capital spending. So again, that's the maintaining of, of that edge. Now, Texas Instruments, again, we talked about analog semiconductors. And again, this is the misunderstood part, I think. I think there's kind of two cohorts of misunderstanding. One is people hear analog and immediately assume it's the old technology that serves no real meaningful long-term purpose. You described it perfectly, and it kind of paraphrases what Texas Instruments says, is that analog semiconductors are how digital semiconductors communicate and interact with the real world, things like power management, producing a signal that we can see and hear, like something – Kind of important, you know, somebody presses the brakes in the car and the brake lights come on, you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, machines, industrial equipment, um, the digital semiconductor parsing all of that data and then deciding on an action. There's an analog semiconductor that actually causes those industrial machines to do whatever that action is, right? So deeply, deeply important as more devices become connected, as more devices have um, computers in them, controlling them, semiconductors, the proliferation of analog semiconductors is only going to grow. Now, we talked about Texas or uh, Taiwan Semi kind of staying at the front of the technology curve and re constantly having to resharpen its blade with that capital spending. Texas Instruments customers, by and large, the industries that's really kind of focused on and built its moats in, they prioritize reliability durability and replaceability. Mm -hmm. If you have a million dollar piece of capital equipment that you expect to run in your factory or provide some function in your business for 20 years, you can't just go spend another million dollars because a $200 semiconductor is no longer available from the manufacturer, right? Right. So the, 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 the as a product of its focus, it's been able to, and, so, and this is part of like the second part of like the, the misconceptions is the idea that it's just this commodity business. 
<laughs> but it's built these massive moats around its commodity business because right now there's this, there's a line somewhere printing wafers that they designed 20 years ago, right? That they're still selling because there's economic demand. And as a result, as much as we talk about how Taiwan Semi, it would take, you know, billions of dollars and multiple years being spent to kind of catch up to what it is. Companies could start – somebody could start doing that. Somebody could raise $25 billion and start building a mini Taiwan Semi just about at any time, and somebody would come to them, right? They may not have the same profitability and cost advantages, but there would be demand. It would be very hard for somebody to replicate what Taiwan or what Texas Instruments has built at any scale – because of what it's established over the past 20 years and the moats that it's already built around it and the extreme cost advantages that it has that I don't think we necessarily appreciate enough. Absolutely. And that addresses, I had two reasons for wanting to do this with you, Jason. The first was your tweet. The second I've started to see, I hope I'd have never contributed to this, but I feel like I may have worded things at some point that were misconstrued that point you said about them being a commoditized business. And I've seen, and that's true. A lot of these parts, like you said, they're very cheap, replaceable parts that go into machinery. But Texas Instruments does not gain its strength because it focuses on these commoditized parts that no one else is interested in. That's right. That's not true. Like you just said, it's there's plenty of people that would love to have 70% gross profit margins like Texas Instruments does, but they right. just this can't is, touch this it. Is, this is a company manufacturing a quote-unquote commodity product getting 70% gross margins on the, yeah. on the manufacturing side. And actually, over the past three years, superior operating margins mm -hmm. over, over Taiwan Semiconductor. Nick, the one thing I want to really emphasize here – We've talked about like the, the the durability and the and the replaceability part of it, which is is a, a central to its its strategy. But I think we also have to acknowledge, we should acknowledge that this is a company that spends between one and a half and three billion dollars a year on research and development. It releases thousands of new products every year, and one of its other really powerful economic moats is. It's e-commerce business, mm -hmm. and this is something that it's still only a few years into its existence, but the company has like 100,000 customers. I mean, just think about that. This is, you know, a company that's it's, – it's not, it's not selling to semiconductors or us, right, where people are coming in and buying them off of semiconductor or us's shelf. It's selling it directly to companies that are designing and manufacturing a product, and a small cohort of companies – of course, make up an outsized portion of that revenue. So you think about for Taiwan Semi's the same way, right? You've got mm -hmm. the Apples and Nvidia's that are huge customers for them, and it's similar for Taiwan or for Texas Instruments. But the differentiator is it's built this great e-commerce platform where if you're a small product developer, you're making a product, and you you don't you can't just pick up the phone and somebody at one of these big companies is going to answer, and you can demand that price. It's really easy for you to get on their website and find the off-the-shelf product that's going to meet your needs. And if you are developing something that needs a newer technology, that's more on that, that, that leading edge for the analog side, this is the company that's spending a ton of money to develop those products too. Right. It, it's a, it's a unique business model um, because of the end markets it serves and growing end markets. So you've already mentioned automotive uh, and, all the fun stuff happening there with electrification, advanced driver assist, someday, maybe, but I have my doubts, full autonomy, uh, but then also robotics and industrials. Slapping that e-commerce business on top of it uh, is a really, really good point, Jason, that I had not thought about for a while, and I have not seen anyone else mention either. Uh, it's a pretty powerful vertically integrated business. Um, Taiwan yeah. Semi does not even have the ability to do, to do that because customers, it doesn't serve small customers generally that can just order stuff off the shelf. Right, right. So maybe 
we can pivot here for a little bit. And I think this is an interesting point. So if we were able to bring the team at Berkshire Hathaway in with us, Jason, wouldn't that be a treat? <laughs> Me, you, Uncle Warren, Ted and Todd, just sitting around <laughs> drinking Cokes. Yeah. Uh, and so you mentioned those two guys. Well, here's here's my question. Now I'm now I'm babbling and getting ahead of myself here. Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's giant investing conglomerate, bought Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing earlier in 2022. Not Texas Instruments. <laughs> why right. not? Right. Why do, you, why do you think that choice was made? A couple of thoughts here. A couple of of reasons. Number one, I think maybe kind of like Apple here. The initial Apple investment was brought to Warren, right? It was one of one of his uh, lieutenants that made that initial investment. And then over time, Warren Buffett spent time with um, Tim Cook, got to understand the business. And like it's, it's economic moats, like the, the brand power, like Coca-Cola, right, um, that Apple has. Um, and then the then, – and then, of course, Warren became – very, very, obviously very, um, uh, a strong believer in, in Apple as an investment. It's by far the biggest investment in the company. I don't, I don't think that this was a decision that Buffett had much involvement with. I'm sure he knew it's, you know, billions. I think it was a $4 billion investment. Mm -hmm. so it's a substantial, it's a sizable amount of money, but it's not substantial for Buffett or for Berkshire portfolio money. But but I but I think kind of like with Apple and a lot of the other big investments that that Berkshire tends to make in stock, it tends to be in large companies that have really large scale that are really that already have pretty substantial scale and really big addressable markets. And Taiwan Semi, I think, certainly has that over Texas Instruments. Right. The, mm -hmm. the, the reality is that the silicon that it makes um, is a bigger market and it's bigger dollars. Um, and, and there's a tremendous amount to like, but I think the other part of it too, Nick, is sometimes we forget like with these, these, um, these, um, the way we find out about these, the SEC filing is done 45 days after the end of the quarter that it happened. So it could be like four and a half months before, <laughs> <laughs> before we actually find out when it happened. So that purchase happened sometime between like, I don't know, July and September of last mm -hmm. year. And if you look at if you look at Taiwan Semiconductor stock, it was it was down like forty percent from the high at, at that time, and Texas Instruments wasn't quite the same value. And again, I don't think they were even like, well, which one of these do we buy? I don't think that was even like a conversation. I don't even know that like a single synapse even fired over that. I also don't think they were anchoring on that forty percent decline, but they were looking at the large company, they were looking at the valuation, they were looking at its moats, and the fact that it kind of checked off all those markets um, and it, and it just, it made sense. I think it just made, it made sense. And I support their decision. I do. Yeah. It, it's, it introduces something brand new to the Berkshire portfolio. So now mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I actually forgot to mention, I have no horse in this race. I don't own TSM or TXN directly, but I do now own Taiwan semi via my Berkshire Hathaway holding. Um, one other thing here that I think is maybe possible, maybe it swayed the team at Berkshire. Uh, so 40% of their portfolio is Apple, which is astounding that yeah. the Berkshire Hathaway empire has 40% of its money in Apple at this point. Uh, Apple Berkshire is, has never spent this many dollars on a single stock before. It's yeah, had, a, it's it's had an acquisition that was bigger. But it's one of its largest acquisitions ever. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 really mind boggling. Um, with such a huge stake on that, though, I I have to think at some point maybe they were looking for possible ways they could hedge, and because Apple is so tied at the hip with Taiwan Semi at this point, you know every every iPhone advancement that comes out every year, you can thank Taiwan Semi for. Right. Uh, if TSM ceases to exist, we're going back a few years on, on, uh, iPhone models. So probably not the primary reason, but perhaps, perhaps that was a reasoning for adding Taiwan semi into the mix. They yeah, were going to pass see some that. cost increases onto Apple. 
right. for some of these newer chips. Well, and we saw we saw Taiwan Semi certainly has pricing power. I guess it's yeah. a little over a year ago now that it raised prices by by double digits, and there, I mean, there wasn't a big blowback from from its nope. customers. No, where, where are you going to go? Right, who else you go to? Right, a competitor. A that's competitor who you're going to go to. That's yeah. uh, <laughs> probably not going to do as good a job, but right. All right, so. A lot of reasons here why, uh, despite Berkshire Hathaway's decision last summer, probably, uh, Texas Instruments, you could definitely make the case as the stronger company. But let's not take too much away from Taiwan Semi. Great, great company. Um, what exactly gives Taiwan Semi its strength, its power, its edge? Uh, because if I understand it correctly, Jason, you actually own both stocks, right? You own Texas Instruments and Taiwan Semi. I do. And the interesting thing is I actually own more Taiwan Semiconductor than I do Texas Instruments. And part of that is because like Berkshire, I, you know, I, I took advantage of some of the opportunity the market has given us. I, I followed Taiwan Semi for four or five years. And frankly, frankly, I struggled. This is one, one of the few ones that I got right. I struggled with the valuation. Mm. And as it came down, um, I, I I relatively aggressively built out a position. I've only more recently started to do the same thing with, with Texas Instruments. And again, I think that a lot of its, its capital investments are, are necessary to stay ahead of it. If, if it's not going to spend this money to stay ahead, Samsung will. Um, Intel will eventually get out of their own way and figure out how to stand up a, a, um, a contract manufacturing business if, if – Taiwan Semiconductor is not staying at the front of the of the edge. But I bring up those two specifically because that's really Taiwan Semi's secret sauce. Mm -hmm. Its customers absolutely know that they will never, ever compete with Taiwan Semiconductor. If you're not having the most advanced chips made by Taiwan Semi, Samsung's really about your only choice, right? Mm -hmm. Other choice out there to do it at scale. But you know what? If you're making a smartphone... Samsung makes smartphones. If you're making a TV, Samsung makes TVs. If you're making a appliance. If you're making any consumer electronic device and you're going to, 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 to Samsung for your chips, you're going to your competitor, right? And this is also the thing that I think Intel is going to have to work really hard to prove um, that it can actually stand up a business to, to, to manufacture for customers build an entire customer support organization from the ground up and completely wall it off from its vertically integrated semiconductor business to have any chance of, of really competing. Um, and, and I've, I've kind of turned honestly the past year from being optimistic that Pat Gelsinger can do that to not sure that shareholders are going to give him enough time to do it, mm -hmm. but it always comes back again to that economic moat with Taiwan semi is they built this business from the ground up to make semiconductors for everybody else and never compete against its customers. And there is a massive amount of value to that that has brought everybody to them. And that's resulted in like network effect strengths where you go to them and it helps you when your competitor goes to them too, because it drives everybody's costs down and lifts everybody up and, you know, helps add to the bottom line for, for Taiwan semiconductor. Yeah, it, it is an incredible business model. Uh, you'll even see this sometimes when semiconductor, fabulous semiconductors talk about merging with each other. They'll talk about um, synergy. And oftentimes we think synergy means, oh, you're, you're firing people. Right. Awesome. But oftentimes what they mean is synergy because they can combine their chips together when they go to a Taiwan semiconductor, uh, they get the the bigger order. And so it drives down their, their unit cost. Uh, it's, that's it's that's the key, so. right? I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna sit on that for a second, Nick, because let's just talk about just plain old manufacturing 101, because mm -hmm. that's, that's really, as much as we'd love the tech and we talk about the, the, their advance and all that stuff, if you wanna make money as a manufacturer, you have to do two things really well. Number one, you have to get your fixed costs as low as you possibly can. And then you have to maximize the throughput of every line that you have. Right. And that's what Nick's talking about here. As a manufacturer, 
I have to sell X number of products just to cover my expenses. And then every dollar above that that I get, maybe the first $100 I get, I don't know, maybe $50 of pure profit. And then after that $100, every $100 on top of that, maybe it's $80 of pure profit. It's, it's, it's operating leverage, and it is so important for these kinds of businesses. And that's what, that's what they've built is a business that really maximizes operating leverage at scale in the manuf in semiconductor manufacturing. Yeah, that's, it's an excellent, excellent point, Jason. Um, so in a lot of ways, you know, Taiwan semiconductor is still maybe trying to get to that point that Texas instruments has already achieved where in some ways that moat they've built around their manufacturing process and the relationship they have with their clients is untouchable. Yeah. Um, because as you said, it, it's not an ideal relationship to have manufacturing done via Samsung or Intel if they could also compete against you. Yeah, but no, I think, I think, that's, they do still I think that's fair. I think one thing that's worth mentioning too is I think the reality is that, again, be just because – and this just is one of those things that it happened because of what they're focusing on. The reality is that I don't think Taiwan Semi is ever going to have that long tail moat mm -hmm. just because the, the, the life cycle value of digital semiconductors, is just, it's, it's not going to be 20 years. It's not going to, it's not going to be there and, and that's okay. Right. But it does to me just add to the economic power of, of Texas instruments. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's delve into that a little bit more. Um, we have this point here just to kind of share some, well, you've got operating margins uh, comparison between Texas Instruments and Taiwan Semi. You also have free cash flow per share, uh, which is a fantastic metric uh, very few investors talk about, and we really should talk about it with every business. The most important metric as an investor to follow is operating cash flow and free cash flow. Absolutely. Free cash flow per share, especially, I think, even in this, this particular point, small point in time where we've grown hyper-focused on stock-based compensation, yeah. uh, focusing on free cash flow on a per share basis right. can, can help factor for that problem because, because of the dilution from stock-based comp. Different topic. Uh, but Jason, you've got these charts here doing the side-by-side -side comparison, and it's it's impressive. It really kind of bolsters the point you're making for Texas Instruments here. Walk walk me through walk me through this. So what I did with the data is I went back to when Rich Templeton became CEO in 2004, and I spent like the two or three years before that he was the chief operating officer, so he mm -hmm. was already kind of helping point the company in the direction that it's gone. But I just thought it was really interesting to look at how um, operating margins, um, and profit margin, right? So net margin, um, what's left over at the end mm -hmm. has consistently increased over that 18 years. Um, and it's just remarkable. And what you see that's interesting is that for both operating margin, um, in probably 2017 or 2018, text from instruments, operating margins actually surpassed Taiwan Semi, which have been relatively flat. Mm -hmm. I want to say that this is that's not a bad thing because if you if you've if you're manufacturing semiconductors and you're able to keep pretty flat, really high margins above thirty percent, you're doing very good. Yes. Right? But Texas Instruments has been able to grow its margins, which I think is really important, and it's been able to really stay lean, even it's as it's still spending on things like R and D. Um, to, to, to pass a lot of that onto its, its net profits, which I think is really important. But like you said, cash is really king. There's lots of ways you can kind of torture the numbers to get them to say what you want when you're looking mm -hmm. at things like earnings per share and net income. Cash is a little harder to fake. Mm -hmm. And if you, look, if you look at over that same period, Texas Instruments has, has grown its cash flows per on a per share basis – 836%. Taiwan Semis hasn't been too shabby. It's increased its cash flow, free cash flow per share, like 419%, right? Uh, both have done incredible. 
Taiwan Semi or Texas Instruments lapped Taiwan Semi, which is stunning if you think about it is stunning if you think about what it's been able to do. And I'll point out here too, uh, Jason, because some some might point to this and say something like, "Well, Texas Instruments was kind of um, in sore straits after the dot com bubble when Rich Templeton took over," uh, but but Taiwan it's Semi was like this unheard of company. No one cared about Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing right. in 2004. So right. I think this, this is 18 years, person. right? This is 18 years. I think yeah. that's the point is that over 18 years, lots of things happen. Lots of economic conditions occur. And to do that for almost two decades is, is, is just absolutely remarkable. It is. Can, can we talk about capital spending? Uh, yes. Yes, that ties that ties into this uh, because if you want free cash flow, you have to talk about capital spending. <laughs> you do, you do. So defining free cash flow is cash from operations. So meaning it's the money left over after you've paid for everything to run your business, the cost of goods sold, your your home office expenses, marketing, R and D, all that stuff is paid. All your taxes, interest on debt, all that stuff's paid. Um, that's operating cash flow. Now you've got to spend capital. You've got to buy machines. You've got to increase your factory size, all that stuff. That's not an operating expense. That's a capital expense. So you subtract that from cash from operations, and what's left over is free cash. It's the mm -hmm. cash that's free to do with as you, as you will. And here's the thing. Both of these companies have been relatively aggressive with their – CapEx, as they need to be, because again, right. they're still technology-focused manufacturers. You have to kind of stay on that front edge. Now, what was really compelling to me is, as I've done the research over the past couple of years is back in 2019, I think it was, Taiwan Semi went to its shareholders and said, we are going to aggressively increase our capital spending. We are, we are kind of at a formative moment in the semiconductor industry where over the next decade, there is going to be a massive explosion in demand. Part of the way we need to fund that is by cutting our dividend and mm. cut the dividend 68%. So more than two thirds cut the dividend. And over that period from like the beginning of 2018, Taiwan Semi's cap capital expenditures have increased about threefold. They're up 231%. So it's a little more than a triple. Now, over that same period, Texas Instruments capital expenditures have increased fourfold. They're up 300%. Here's the key, Nick. Texas Instruments has also doubled its dividend over that period. Mm -hmm. Taiwan Semi cut its dividend to help pay for it. Not to mention the share buybacks along the way, which... We know Rich Templeton, big fan of taking whatever's left over after the dividend and repurchasing stock with it. Yeah. Uh, very shareholder friendly business here. Bought back more than half the company since he became CEO. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing track record with that. Again, the more I look at this, the more I think you're right, Jason. A Taiwan Semi would love to become, but maybe not be able to become what Texas is. Texas Instruments is today. So I still have, yeah, uh, what's the final takeaways here? You pre you've presented me with a few points here, Jason, that make me think I should maybe get some exposure to Texas Instruments because I already have TSM via my Berkshire stock. Have you, have you convinced yourself you're absolutely right, Texas Instruments, better than Taiwan Semi and maybe just one of the best most efficiently run semiconductor manufacturing businesses there is, period. I, I would I would say we we don't even have to include the word semiconductor in that in that statement. One of the best, most well run uh, economic powerhouse manufacturers in the world, period. And certainly um, in in the top tier in the semiconductor industry. Probably the most important thing I want to I want to stress here is that the beauty of investing is you don't have to pick the horse that's going to win the race. You get to ride more than one horse. Right. Um, and this that's is, true. this is, you know, nothing yet to be detrimental of, of Taiwan semiconductor. These are, I think these are the two manufacturers that are the most important um, in terms of actually making the Silicon 
the two, I think they're the two that are most important now, likely to remain that way. Mm-hmm. And both have good histories of generating good economic returns. I just think Taiwan Semi, the, or the Texas Instruments, the evidence is abundantly clear that it has been the better generator of economic returns for investors. And the moats that it has built are likely to continue to strengthen over time. And investors would do well to, to make it to make it part of their portfolio. I agree. Um, I have I have some qualms and hangups that we should probably reserve for a different conversation. Um, but some of those hangups go out more than five years down the road. Yeah. I get nervous whenever there's a lot of government funding getting funneled into an industry right. uh, like the U.S. Chips Act. Um, I'm also nervous about things like silicon carbide or gallium nitride, which is kind of a um, newer, different material than silicon that Texas Instruments doesn't play in. But um, like I said, maybe a different conversation. And those 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 hangups aside, those qualms aside, uh, I don't think it at all detracts from from your your bold talk, Jason. I appreciate that. I'm I'm glad that I have that you now have the, you have the zeal of the newly converted. Nick, <laughs> welcome to the cult. All right. All right. Jason, I really appreciate you coming on. I think this conversation, it's been, of course, really helpful to me. Um, so like I said at the outset, that's a win as far as I'm concerned. But I think I think a lot of investors that, that follow this space closely and are looking for a way to profit off of technology, major technology trends in the coming decade, I think they're going to find this helpful as well. Jason. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you really enjoyed that that conversation I had with Nick a few weeks ago. Up next is going to be a little ad break here. Hopefully it's an ad break because we could use the money. Um, if it's not an ad break, you're just going to hear me and Jeff again. But stay tuned after the ad break because we do have some more content coming to you. Hey, everybody. Welcome back from that ad break. As promised, Jeff and I have some more content here for the last few minutes on the episode. Jeff, what are we doing? Well, the first thing I wanted to do was get your thoughts on uh, Berkshire Hathaway, the news today that uh, they sold uh, most of their stake in Taiwan Semiconductor. And what's interesting to me, and I want to hear your thoughts, but what jumped out to me was this is a position that they opened just last quarter. Well, so first of all, the 13F that drops today is... um, all of the movements that happened in the fourth quarter, right? So we don't really know when this happened. It could have been October 1st. It could have been December 30th. Um, but what's interesting is the the Berkshire Hathaway purchase of Taiwan Semiconductor happened during Q3 of 2022. So this was a stock that Berkshire Hathaway held for a quarter. It's interesting to me. Like you don't, you think of, of Buffett and Berkshire as being long-term buy and hold, you know, not necessarily forever and ever. I mean, they've sold things in the past, but one quarter is not, not common with, with their holdings. Yeah. I th- you know, this is, this is, so the, the first thing I want to say is I want to get back to that, that time period you talk about with these 13 F documents. And you, you read, you read the articles all the time when these quarterly 13 Fs are filed you know, Buffett sold this, I can bought that, you know, all of these large money investors, they're required to file these 13 Fs that disclose their holdings at the beginning and the end of the quarter. But it's, th- this is the big thing. It's February 14th. And we're talking about transi- transactions that happened between October and December of 2022. Right. Yeah. Right. Long time ago in, ter- in, in terms of what can happen in the market. Five months. I mean, right. It, it's a very, very, very long time. So that's the first thing I think it's important to just to contextualize, contextualize that. But with that said, yeah, this is, this was kind of, it was surprising to me um, in the, in the conversation that everybody just heard, it came up, right. Uh, Nick asked me, you know, kind of my thought about, about Berkshire's acquiring uh, a position in Taiwan Semi and, and thinking about it. And Nick had some insight about thinking about Apple. Um, and maybe the Taiwan Semi investment was maybe a hedge against Apple, right? Because Taiwan Semi and Apple are pretty tied together because Taiwan Semi makes all their chips for their for their phones. Not all their chips, but their all the stuff that Apple designs, the semiconductors, right? Um, and And here we are in the next quarter after after that acquisition was was reported 
salt, right? So um, I'm not sure how to respond besides this is why you don't borrow conviction, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. If you're one of those people that did you saw the 13F when it got filed for the third quarter, which would have been July, August, or September, but it would have been not reported in October or November, right? It would have been reported at the at the end of November, right? Or the middle of November, middle right? November, so, yeah. so or no, middle of December, right? So it's it's can't remember now. No, middle of November. You're right. It would have been 45 days. So, and and here you are now. There's a chance that you actually bought based on quote unquote Buffett buying after quote unquote Buffett sold. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you don't borrow conviction. Yeah. And the, you know, we're also doing like, uh, I mean, I know this will be, you know, more than a week old by the time everyone listens to it. So this is a hot take right now, but not necessarily when it, when it drops. Um, and I'm sure more, more news will come out and other people's, you know, analysis of why this happened. Um, but considering we were just happened to be recording an intro and a, and a, second part of the show about semiconductors. And we saw this news we thought it'd be interesting to talk about. So it will be interesting to see by the time this drops um, in, a, in a little over a week, if there's any more information that comes out. And it's also worth remembering for those who kind of follow Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, there is a chance that he mentions this when they do their annual meeting in May. Sometimes he does talk about decisions that they've made. Um, I know, uh, I believe last year, I think it was at the annual meeting, Jason, you can remind me, he did give some, you know, background and color on why they took um, the position in Activision Blizzard. He did talk about that and kind of explain their thinking. So you never know, you might get some insight right. down the road. Well, that was interesting. And it got a ton of attention because that was what seemed to be very un-Buffett. And yeah, he, he was, was doing an arbitrage play, right? Right. Because the price and it still is arbit the uh, Activision Blizzard stock price is still well below Microsoft's agreed to pay price for the acquisition. Um, but yeah, this one's, this one's really interesting because if you look at a chart, that's a great, obviously it's always a great play for a podcast. This to say, when you look at the chart, the, the price at Taiwan semiconductors average stock price during the, during most of that, the second quarter of, of the year was well above, excuse me, the third quarter of the year was well above. Um, a lot of the uh, fourth quarter. So very interesting. All right. So we'll leave that there because it will be a little old by the time it gets uh, played. But we we were talking about what to do in the second part of this episode. And, you know, we we have a couple sort of thematic ideas that we like to kind of cycle into the back end of our podcasts. And the one that I that we said we thought of for this episode that we fun to talk through is I Jason knows a lot about the semiconductor industry and and you just heard some of those thoughts on the first half of the show and I know very little about it so we thought we would we would do a segment we're calling explain this to me like I'm five so for the next couple minutes Jason's gonna um, explain to me like I am five years old the the semiconductor industry which is a big topic so we probably won't hit everything but basically what what as a newer or brand new investor people should know about investing in this space, analyzing the companies in this space, the different types of companies in this space. I know a little bit about some of them, but I want to hear more. So take it away. So the first thing I'm going to say is look in the show notes, find Nick's channel, find Nick's Twitter and follow him. Yeah. And you're going that, to learn step one. Reason. Absolutely. It's step one. It really is. It's step one. He's a very intelligent individual and he's really good at communicating these, uh, these complicated industries in, in a way that makes it more, uh, it makes it easier to consume, particularly as an investor, right? Because it's all kind of investor focus where he's coming from. I, I am not an expert in semiconductors by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not an engineer. I'm not trained in any of those sorts of things, but what I do know is like the big picture and thinking about very cyclical industries like the semiconductor and, and industries like uh, the semiconductor industry that have lots of different parts of its value chain, um, lots of different um, um, end users. Uh, semiconductors do all kinds of different things. Like a lot of people don't realize that you know, solar panel makers are semiconductor manufacturers. These are 
physically they're semiconductors, right? So we don't tend to think of them that way when we're talking about the semiconductor industry. And a lot of times we kind of lump all of the companies together when we say a semiconductor stock. Let me tell you, NVIDIA is very different than Texas Instruments, is very different than Taiwan Semiconductor, TSMC. So that's a really important thing is understanding all of these different players and, and where they fit in. So that's that's my first question. That's the place I wanted to start. So my understanding is you can think of the semiconductor industry and the companies that are within it sort of like in, in buckets based on what they do, right? And so my understanding is you have some companies that design the chips. And I, and I think NVIDIA fits into that bucket, but they don't physically make the chips, a company right. like NVIDIA. And AMD, I believe, is similar. Um, Correct. Then you have the companies that do make the chips, mm -hmm. like Taiwan Semiconductor, um, Samsung, I believe, right? Is that another one? Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk through like sort of if you were going to like bucket the the the, yeah. the companies as in terms of like what they do? I know there are some vertically integrated ones that kind of do it all. So talk through that part. So that that's important, right? So again, thinking about semiconductor industry, the way I think about the industry at large is I tried to break it up into those buckets like you're talking about. So you have the the companies that design the chips. You have so that would be a, and you you named a couple of them there with Nvidia and AMD, right? Those those are two of the largest companies that that are the fabulous semiconductor makers. They, they design them, um, proprietary designs, and then they work with other customers uh, with customers design too. But they mostly just design. Uh, for their for their end products, and then they work with the semiconductor contract manufacturers. These are companies that that they make chips. Taiwan Semi is um, TSMC is the most uh, prominent of these because they only manufacture semiconductors for other companies. They do not sell to end users. They do not make them for their own products. That's different than than. Um, Samsung, which is, does have a very large foundry business, but it also manufactures semiconductors for itself, right? Right. Think so Taiwan Samsung. Semi is sort of like the agnostic. We don't take in Switzerland. They, they, they take no yeah, sides. Exactly. They, exactly. they make chips for everyone. And so there's no real competition issues when you come to them to make your chips. And then you have a, a vertically integrated business like Intel, right? Where they design their chips, they operate the foundries, they sell them into retail. They sell them to manufacturers. Um, they they actually use Taiwan Semi a little bit for some manufacturing for some of their some of their things. So um, that's so the, so you, 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 there's there's hybrid versions, right? You have Samsung that's kind of a hybrid. Then you have the fully vertically integrated, um, and going all the way to the other extreme, which is is uh, tax, um, TSMC. Now. The so far we've we've just talked about the companies that deal with with digital semiconductors that things that power smartphones and like the brains I guess best way to think about them, these are the brains right these are the the ones that process data and do something with it um, then you have analog semiconductors and that's where Texas Instruments fits in and you may be thinking well analog means it's old outmoded technology no a digital semiconductor is the the semiconductor that we think about the TSMC makes or that Intel makes that handles data, does computations, right? And the analog semiconductor is the way that digital devices interact with the real world. Things like power management, producing a video signal, audio, radio signals, like all of that stuff, that's analog semiconductors. Um, Texas Instruments is a big vertically integrated manufacturer of analog semiconductors. You with me so far? Yeah. And I, so the two, the two, one of the two companies I own in this space is um, Texas Instruments, and the reason I do, like my sort of really basic, le le basic level thesis for owning it is, I like the fact that they're a play on the analog chips, like I, which I just sort of like think of my head as like the dumb chips, right? Like I want my alarm clock to work, I want my microwave to to work, I want my refrigerator to work. You know, you want your brake lights on your car to work, right? All of that uses. You, you know, want the, that five million dollar machine that has an actuator that's connected to an analog semiconductor that manufactures products for another company in your portfolio to work. Right. So yeah. yes, you need these yeah. bleeding edge technology chips that are going to go in self driving cars and data centers and all that stuff. And but then you also need the the, the simple chips that just you know, like I said, make your you know your, your microwave work. Um, 
and then the, the, the other one, and then I don't know if you want to go here yet, but the other one that I own is ASML, mm -hmm. which is a company that basically makes the machines that every chip manufacturer needs to make chips. And they're the only company in the world that does, um, that makes these machines, at least the higher technology end ones. So they sort of have this like monopoly in the business and none of the companies can sort of work without them. Um, so there's these other sort of, you know, right. there's the big buckets that you just talked at. And then there's like ASML is sort of in its own little space. There's the designers on one end, the manufacturers on the other. And in the middle, there's the uh, service providers and equipment providers to the manufacturers. Right. ASML is one of those. And then there's other companies that you, we don't think of as being semiconductor companies, but other companies are making their own chips or designing their own chips. Like, for example, Apple has started to make their yeah. own chips. And I think I, I was, I'm glad you mentioned Apple because I was going to I was going to bring up that Apple may be one of the more important semiconductor companies in the world because they do. They design all of the processors for all of their devices. They for a very long time, they were partnered with Intel with Intel. Right? Yeah. And and they moved away from that partnership in a large part because they wanted to have more control, but also because Intel had fallen behind. And, and they weren't, you can, the reality was that they could design far better um, processors than they were able to get from Intel, particularly as more devices have become battery operated, right? And, and power, the power profile became more and more of a concern. So that's good. I want to, I want to talk about those service providers, those companies in the middle for a minute, because they're incredibly important. Here's the interesting thing about it. The, if you, if you go to a, let's say you need to have 10,000 color flyers printed or marketing material, or uh, maybe you decide you, you want to buy Tide, the company, and you need to have your soapboxes printed. Those machines, the, 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 the printers, the offset presses use something called lithography. It's a very, very old basic technology, right? Behind printing. Lithography is the same technology that is used to print semiconductors. The only, only the difference is that like ASML's machines use um, ultra um, extreme ultraviolet light, get those very very small <laughs> sizes to paint the image onto the wafer. Um, these companies are very very important because companies like ASML, for example, has such a lead, a technical lead that's nobody else is within years of having the capabilities to, to develop, to, to produce my, um, uh, semiconductors is advanced. And sometimes it's easy to miss those companies because they're in that middle part where you've never heard of the name, right? So um, I think investors would do really well to start to learn more about those sorts of companies, companies that make software that can replicate that, that design, you know, the hundreds of times or millions of times for the individual little in, tiny parts of the semiconductor. So you think about all of those parts of the of the value chain, right? And what's at the very end of it, the end markets are generally always very cyclical, right? If we go back to the pandemic, two things happened at the same time. The industrial cycle for semiconductors slammed on the brakes. If you were Ford or Toyota, any automaker, you called your, your supplier and you canceled your orders for semiconductors, right? If you were Logitech, you were calling immediately to triple your orders because nobody was going to drive everywhere, but everybody was going to be on Zoom. Yeah, right? exactly. So we saw the, the, the cycles flip, right? Um, and this is historically, this is normal for the semiconductor industry. That's, that's an extreme example. But here we are today, and things have kind of flipped, right? We pulled forward many years of, of demand for consumer electronics, and now they're just starting to catch up for the auto industry. And that's interesting because you just reminded me, I lied when I said there's two companies I own. I actually also own NVIDIA. And what, and one of the reasons I like that company, even though I've forgotten I owned it for a few minutes. Jeez. Um, well, no, it's exactly what you just said. Like one of the things I think is a is a help to them is they're, they're pretty diversified in where they design chips, right? So they mm -hmm. design chips for, for automobiles. They design chips for data centers. They design chips for professional visualization. They design chips for gaming. 
So if any one of those parts of the semiconductor supply, you know, uh, e ecosystem have a down cycle, they theoretically will have demand somewhere else unless the entire, you know, semiconductor supply chain, you know, kind of goes down. So I, I and, and I'm glad you talked about this in general, in general, because I want my last question I wanted to ask was your thoughts on the cyclicality generally. So I have two kind of questions, like, are there any parts of the semiconductor world that you think are more resilient to these cyclical downturns? And then my other question is, do you think over time as technology advances, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be, it's pretty certain in my mind that the future will have more chips in it than the, than, than the past did. Do we start to see less cyclicality because we get to a point where basically everything has a semiconductor in it? I, I'm I'm not. Uh, other really smart people that I know have said they expect the industry to become less cyclical. I think maybe eventually, but if we think about what's happening right now, I think we have evidence that that's maybe not necessarily true. But we are already seeing like the swings are not as big for some of the stock prices for for some of the right. companies. In the so there might chain. still be downturns, but they don't last as long. And yeah, kind of right. Like me so memory is a, is semiconductors too, right? So we still see kind of bigger swings there because a lot of those products kind of where they where they sit can be affected pretty quickly but by and large i think because the secular trend right now is growth and expansion we're going to go through a period where maybe the cyclical swings aren't as significant but once the industry's mature again we're going to be back where we back where we were right those end markets are going to be the end markets and the cyclicality is going to be there but i, I think the key thing to remember when you think about that cyclicality and you think about it with, with regards to semiconductor companies, we'd love to think about them as just these advanced, great leading edge companies. And they are, and some of them like Nvidia, I'll be honest with you, my bigger, my bigger bull thesis for Nvidia when it comes to that is that it's, it has low fixed costs. It's, it's not a manufacturer. So that means it's that asset light model. And I appreciate that because it's less it, less likely to upend the economic output of the company, right? Earnings right. may fall, revenue may fall, but the likelihood of it flipping to a big loss when revenue falls is much less than it is for, for a manufacturer at scale. Yeah, they don't have... Look at what's happening with Intel right now, where m modest revenue declines are absolutely gutting their profits. It, NVIDIA is not structured for the same sort of thing to happen, right? right? So that's really important to think about and when you think about like a Taiwan semiconductor, for example, at scale, once we get kind of through this growth period, the way I'm going to be thinking about a company like Taiwan Semi is I want to be very conscious of what their fixed costs are. Because as much as this company has incredible operating margins uh, and cash margins that we don't often see for a manufacturer, at some point in its cycle, the reality, and I talked about this on the on the conversation with with Nick that everybody just listened to, at some point, it's spending just to stay ahead of everybody else, right? To, to remain that leading manufacturer. And it, ha it has to spend just to keep its blade sharp, right? At some point, the incremental gains of that capital spending is going to reduce, and it's going to be exposed to the same kind of risks as, say, an automaker. It's just I think we're a very long time before we get to that point in, in its, its growth cycle. Yeah, exactly. All right, Jeff, we did it, buddy. Yeah, this was a, I'm really happy we did a whole episode on semiconductors because it's a, it's a part of the investing world that I'm still trying to learn about. So this is this was great just listening to, to you and Nick earlier and then having this conversation. Yeah, I think the best part of it, Jeff, was that you were only in half of it. That is a benefit to this episode. You're absolutely <laughs> correct. I kid, I kid, my friend. All right, well, as always, just a reminder, We'd love to give our answers to these hard questions, but it's up to you to find your own answers out there, friends. And I believe in you. All right, Jeff, we'll see you next time, buddy. See you next time.